Bom dia a todos. Sejam bem-vindos ao Sesc Vila Mariana para a abertura do Seminário Utopia 500 Anos, uma realização do Sesc São Paulo em parceria com o People's Palace Project e apoio do British Council e da Queen Mary University of London. O seminário apresentará um conjunto de discussões inspiradas na importante obra A Utopia, do escritor inglês Thomas More. Foi lançada em 1516 e completa neste ano 500 anos de existência. Será debatido ao longo dos dois dias do seminário o contexto histórico de surgimento do conceito de utopia, as matrizes de pensamento de Thomas More e algumas perspectivas contemporâneas relacionadas ao conceito de utopia. Apresentarão esses temas importantes pesquisadores e intelectuais brasileiros e estrangeiros de, de, de desculpe, diferentes áreas do pensamento e campos de atuação. Antes de darmos início à abertura formal do evento, registramos as congratulações do senhor ministro de Estado da Cultura, Juca Ferreira, aos organizadores, proponentes e presentes ao seminário. E para iniciarmos os trabalhos desta manhã, convidamos ao palco o diretor regional do SESC São Paulo, professor Danilo Santos de Miranda. Bom dia a todos, todas. Sempre quando nós iniciamos uma atividade nesse espaço, nesse teatro do Sesc Vila Mariana, e em outros teatros também, em outros espaços que o Sesc tem espalhado pelo Estado e pelo Brasil todo, eu faço questão de dizer que nesse espaço sempre acontecem muitas coisas. Aqui tem espetáculos, música, teatro, dança, é, das diversas linguagens. Aqui tem debates, seminários, figuras eminentes da literatura, do, da filosofia, da cultura. Tem participado de muitos eventos aqui. Portanto, eu estou num palco, invadindo um pouco uma área que eu costumo dizer que não é propriamente minha, na medida em que o palco é espaço dos artistas, normalmente, para apresentar mais um evento, mais um importante evento como esse, né? nesse mesmo espaço onde figuras como Morin, como Saramago, como outros autores e atores, tiveram presentes também. Então, para mim, é sempre uma honra muito grande estar aqui e falar sempre dessa imensa variedade de ações que nós do SESC realizamos com o objetivo exatamente de aprofundar debates, discutir questões, apresentar espetáculos que promovam essa discussão, que realizem, de alguma forma, esta missão da instituição, que é sempre uma missão de caráter educativo, de caráter... É, provocativo, no sentido de aumentar o nosso nível de percepção, de possibilidades, de riqueza de conhecimento, de modo que a gente possa se entender melhor, entender melhor o mundo à nossa volta e, dessa maneira, poder construir um mundo melhor sempre. E essa é a missão hoje também. Né? Estamos aqui para esse seminário sobre Utopia, 500 anos. O seminário que se realiza aqui, que eu tenho o prazer de abrir, em nome do SESC, e que vou dividir essa abertura com meu amigo Paul Heritage, People's Palace Projects, e do British Council. Somos nós três que estamos promovendo, realizando este evento aqui, com a participação de várias, várias contribuições importantes. Temos aqui alguns convidados, alguns que já estão entre nós e alguns que chegarão para poder participar nesses dois dias de intensa discussão. Temos o nosso amigo Gregory Kleis, que está aqui na frente, que é autor desse livro, Utopia, a História de uma Ideia, que, aliás, coincidentemente, coincidentemente, foi lançado pelo Sesc há um ano, mais ou menos, né? no ano passado. Então, nós temos aqui a oportunidade também 
de ouvir o autor dessa publicação, que, de outra parte, e considerando aspectos mais interessantes e universais, foi um livro lançado no mundo inteiro, em várias línguas, com várias é, edições ao mesmo tempo, em várias línguas, e nós participamos desse, desse, desse movimento, dessa operação, né, lançado aqui no Brasil, e tivemos é, a oportunidade, portanto, de participar desse intenso movimento. A nossa a edições Sesc, que é uma parte do trabalho do Sesc, pôde realizar isso. Nós temos ainda o Jerry Broughton, que está aqui conosco também, o Mércio Pereira Gomes, que está aqui conosco, Edson Passetti, Orlando Zaccone, Eduardo Suplicy, que vai participar também, nosso ex-senador e secretário da Prefeitura de São Paulo, Ronaldo Lemos, Lígia de Veiga Pereira, Renato Stutman, Gerson Baniva, Muniz Sodré, Joade Reimon e Marcos Falcini. Esse grupo de pessoas que vai participar desse nosso é, encontro. Trata-se de encontro que se volta para a discussão de temas inspirados na obra A Utopia, de Thomas More, com abordagem envolvendo o seu contexto histórico de origem e as e os prismas contemporâneos relacionados aos sentidos do termo utopia. Né? O evento está estruturado a partir de temas como contexto histórico da obra, recepção, religião, poder, estética, ética, entre outros. Portanto, tem uma abrangência importante, especialmente nesse momento. Vamos ter a conferência de abertura com o nosso amigo Gregory daqui a pouco, né? conforme já mencionei. O livro, portanto, foi lançado em 1516, por Thomas More, o Não Lugar, Utopia, o Não Lugar. Né? Qual o significado de tudo isso hoje, especialmente para nós, que vivemos nossos dramas pessoais, sociais, políticos, tão sérios e profundos, na nossa realidade no Brasil e em grande parte do mundo, mas que, especialmente agora, pensar um pouco o que, é que nós desejamos, para onde nós desejamos ir, quais são as perspectivas que nós imaginamos para o nosso futuro. Inventar lugares ideais é uma prática muito comum na história de todos os povos. Tais lugares, no entanto, estão em um tempo irrecuperável, ou então num espaço inalcançável. Como podemos atualizar os sentidos da utopia? Qual a importância social da esperança nos dias que correm? Talvez possamos falar da utopia como uma mola propulsora das nossas ações. Me refiro a um agir não atado a valores do presente, mas baseado em condições imaginadas envolvendo a crença de que esses lugares possam, ao menos parcialmente, vir a existir. A utopia alimentaria, assim a possibilidade de atuar sem as amarras da necessidade de operar sem o peso do cotidiano, empenhando as potências do devir. Seria uma espécie de antídoto ao pensamento simplificador uma liberação das disputas superficiais e das restrições que pesam sobre nossos corpos e atribulam nossas mentes. Thomas More, autor da obra que legou o nome Utopia, nos inspira a pensar nas disputas de sentido sobre o mundo. Morreu decapitado por se opor aos interesses privados, particulares, do rei Henrique VIII. Exatamente por ter defendido os princípios papais na época contra o rei, Thomas More foi posteriormente santificado pela Igreja Católica Romana, São Thomas More. Mas, ironicamente, curiosamente, também é considerado mártir da reforma pela Igreja Anglicana, instituição a qual se opunha. 
Curioso. A imagem de Thomas More foi ainda relacionada com o surgimento das ideias socialistas, um dos primeiros monumentos construídos após a Revolução Russa de 1917, por ordem de Lenin, rendeu-lhe homenagem como pensador revolucionário. Esse quadro ajuda a pensar que o não lugar da utopia, da utopia está repleto de conotação política, Daí a importância de explorarmos múltiplos sentidos da obra de Thomas More, de discutir seus significados sem redição a lugares comuns. Eu diria, portanto, que a utopia, no fundo, um convite para mirar o horizonte com uma generosidade que o presente, por vezes, nos impede de fazê-lo. Como testemunho dessa visão, os deixo uma frase breve, direta e necessária de Oscar Wilde. Um mapa do mundo que não inclua utopia não vale sequer ser olhado, diz Oscar Wilde. Desejo, portanto, que nesses dias possamos visitar muitas e múltiplas utopias. Obrigado. Agradecemos as palavras do professor Danilo e gostaríamos de convidar agora ao palco o senhor Paul Heritage, diretor artístico do People's Palace Projects. Bom dia. Good morning. E muito obrigado ao Danilo por essas palavras de inspiração para começar nossos dois dias. As raízes deste seminário encontram-se em 2014, quando o British Council Brasil e People's Palace Projects promoveram junto um programa grande para celebrar o aniversário de 45, 45, 450 anos do nascimento de Shakespeare. E Mércio Gomes, que está aqui com a gente hoje, me perguntou o que os britânicos vão fazer para celebrar um outro grande aniversário em 2016? Os 500 anos da publicação de Utopia. Na, na verdade, nossos planos na época, ainda em 2014, estavam totalmente focados num outro grande aniversário shakespeariano, os 400 anos desde sua morte. Tenho certeza que Mércio não estava sugerindo que Thomas More seria mais importante do que nosso querido dramaturgo nacional, mas ele me deu um toque bem claro que 2016 não pudesse passar sem reconhecer o aniversário de um livro que marcou a maneira que a Europa visualizou e se relacionou com o Brasil durante mais que três séculos e talvez até hoje. Pouco depois, minha conversa com o Mércio, eu estava numa reunião com o senador Eduardo Suplicy, quando ele começou a ser secretário de Direitos Humanos aqui na cidade de São Paulo. E mais uma vez, um brasileiro, esta vez o senador, me lembrou que 2016 seria o momento de celebrar o legado de um livro britânico que deu forma a alguns dos mais profundos pensamentos filosóficos e políticos. Então, esses dois brasileiros, Eduardo Suplicy e Mércio Pereira Gomes, a gente deve muito, eu, pessoalmente, devo muito a vocês para este seminário que nós costuramos. Mas o seminário em si começou com um encontro, em 2015, entre o professor Danilo Miranda, Mércio Gomes de novo, Graham Sheffield, o diretor de artes do British Council, e Jerry Broughton, professor de estudos renascentistas da Queen Mary University of London. Eu convidei todos eles para participar num seminário chamado The Art of Cultural Exchange, o Arte de Intercâmbio Cultural. Lá em Londres, conversamos, essas conversas começaram 
e resultaram neste encontro de dois dias aqui em São Paulo. Exatamente como no livro de Utopia, tudo começou com um encontro. Tomara que o formato que a gente criou para realizar este seminário vai estender aquele espírito de encontro. Como o Danilo falou, este seminário, na verdade, está construído em encontros entre sociólogos, ativistas, artistas, políticos, teatrólogos, críticos literários, antropólogos, historiadores e entre brasileiros e britânicos e um francês. Mas, além de tudo, é um encontro entre a visão de Thomas More e nossas perspectivas de hoje. E talvez que lembra que o livro em si começa com aquele encontro entre Thomas More e aqueles marinheiros que voltaram do Brasil. E como a gente sabe, Thomas More escolheu uma maneira muito íntima, quase casual, para apresentar suas ideias utópicas ao mundo, com as duas cartas aos amigos que abrem as alas do livro. Tomara que esta este maneira quase casual, com esta intimidade, a gente vai conseguir, apesar deste grande épica, esta sala épica aqui hoje. Na primeira carta, Mo insiste que o formato e estrutura para debater o tema de utopia não foi difícil encontrar, porque ele só teve que repetir o que ele ouviu do viajante Rafael. Só teve que escrever o que ele ouviu. Eu não vou fingir que nossa tarefa em preparar este seminário foi tão fácil. O livro Utopia viajou para tantos caminhos diversos durante os últimos 500 anos, e seu legado oferece inumeráveis perspectivas ao mundo contemporâneo, que sentimos a falta de, uma, de um Rafael para dizer para nós onde procurar nossa história de utopia para hoje. Em vez de Rafael, Sesc reuniu a sua equipe do Centro de Pesquisa e Formação para debater, aconselhar e construir o formato e conteúdo deste seminário. Gostaria de agradecer e parabenizar André de Araújo Nogueira e sua equipe do Centro de Pesquisa e Formação pela dedicação e sabedoria deles durante o planejamento, especialmente o Danilo Simrot, que, além de ser o gerente mais cuidadoso e paciente do projeto, foi meu guia pessoal no mundo intelectual brasileiro. Que, gente, não é fácil. O British Council existe em mais que 100 países do mundo, mas até agora, Martin e Luiz podem me corrigir, nem o British Council conseguiu estabelecer um escritório em Aircastle ou qualquer outra cidade da utopia. Porém, durante mais que 80 anos, o British Council está criando e fortalecendo diálogos culturais entre o Reino Unido e o Brasil possibilitando que o exercício que Thomas More começou em 1516 pode continuar para enriquecer o desenvolvimento de nossos dois países. Os dois, longe de ser utopias. Mas nas trocas e intercâmbios entre nós, podemos, pelo menos, procurar novas visões além do horizonte. Obrigado, Martin, pelo seu apoio ao projeto para mim, o British Council sempre ofereceu um pouco de utopia desde que me convidou a visitar o Brasil pela primeira vez há 25 anos. Na carta a Peter Gill, em qual Thomas More apresenta seu livro, ele brinca que há algumas pessoas de Inglaterra que gostariam de visitar a utopia. Apesar que isto ainda não esteja possível, alguns visitantes vieram de Inglaterra para o Brasil para participar neste seminário. Nem todos, na verdade, são ingleses. Temos um inglês, um galês e um francês. Mas eles viajaram de Londres para participar em nossos debates esses dois dias. Queen Mary, University of London, nutrou o seminário. Desde a ideia se formulou no ano passado, 
e ficamos gratos pelo apoio desde aquele momento. Há tantas citações no livro de Utopia que me faz pensar em SESC e os projetos que nós, People's Palace Projects e SESC, fizemos juntos durante os anos, seja com jovens em conflito com a lei em Rio de Janeiro, seja com os quadrilheiros no Rio Branco, em Acre, ou com os pontos de cultura aqui em São Paulo. Nem pensei duas vezes em aceitar sua proposta generosa de criar este seminário juntos, porque é o lugar natural para este debate tão importante pelos dias de hoje é aqui com vocês no SESC. Agradeço a todos os palestrantes e debatedores que aceitaram o nosso convite e vocês, o público, que está aqui conosco nesses dois dias. Utopia sempre será uma obra em construção, a work in progress, para ser reiniciado em cada conversa, cada diálogo, cada troca, cada debate, cada dia. E, finalmente, sou diretor de um centro de pesquisa em Queen Mary, Universidade de Londres, que se chama People's Palace Projects, o palácio, o projetos do Palácio do Povo. Por quê? Porque em 1887, lá no leste de Londres, a Rainha Vitória abriu o People's Palace, este Palácio do Povo, para trazer cultura, educação e entretenimento aos povos mais excluídos, mais pobres de Londres, no final do século XIX. Foi uma iniciativa visionária, poética, mas ainda social. Quando criei People's Palace Projects lá na universidade, emprestei o nome deste Palácio do Povo, que agora faz parte da universidade, quando estabelecemos People's Palace Projects há 20 anos, para criar projetos que ainda acreditam na possibilidade de embarcar para a utopia. Boa viagem. Agradecemos as palavras do Sr. Paul e convidamos ao palco o Sr. Martin Dogo, diretor do British Council. Bom dia a todo mundo. Uh, fico muito honrado uh, com esse convite uh, de falar na abertura deste evento, sendo que o Conselho Britânico é um parceiro de muitos anos e décadas do SESC e também do projeto People's Palace. A utop utopia, tem que falar isso correto, né? A utopia foi publicado apenas 16 anos depois da descoberta do Brasil por um jovem Thomas More, que passou um tempo fora de Londres, em Bruges e Bruxelas, e perto da, da Universidade de Rotterdam, numa missão diplomática tentando convencer Carlos V a fazer aliança com Henrique VIII da Inglaterra. Eu quero propor, nesse momento, que o Thomas More foi uma espécie de intelectual uh, europeu que uh, bebeu muito na fonte uh, de ideias europeias, uh, um tipo de conselho britânico da, da época, Uh, em que intelectuais, através da Europa, de uh, Milão, Veneza, outras partes de Itália, Sorbonne, a Cracóvia e tudo, todo mundo se reuniu ou se, uh, se escreveu para trocar ideias contemporâneas nessa época, que, claro, foi um pouco antes da ruptura da reformação, reforma uh, religiosa uh, que quebrou uh, o mundo europeu em mundo protestante e mundo católico. Este período de seis meses fora do país aprofundou as ideias e pensamento de Thomas More, sendo que ele forjou uma grande amizade com Erasmus e bebeu na fonte de filosofia e ideias dos países baixos. 
na época um lugar que uh, contrabalançou a poder renascista uh, de Itália. Podemos até dizer que os dois livros sobre poder, organização de sociedade, como governar dessa época, são de um lado a uh, Utopia e no outro lado O Príncipe, de Machiavelli. Claro que estão livros totalmente opostos, no sentido de que, do que Machiavelli tenta mostrar um caminho, caminho digamos, maquiaveliano uh, para os gerentes das pequenas cidades de repúblicas a governar, enquanto o humor demonstrou um país que com, com certeza não existiria. Utopia, nowhere. É interessante que Moore diz que o narrador, o Rafael Hitler D, é português de nascimento, que viajou para as Índias, inclusive para Ceylon, atual Sri Lanka, e depois Calicut, ambos centros de comércio na época estabelecidos por navegantes e mercadores portugueses. Como escritor, ele faz uma certa confusão entre as Índias ocidentais e orientais, um pouco como Shakespeare depois fez a mesma coisa na tempestade, está situado nas Bermudas ou no Mediterrâneo. E ele cita Américo Vespucci, o florentino, que fez quatro viagens às Américas como co-viajante. Inclusive, ele também tem uma passagem bem interessante, onde fala que, uh, quando você chega no Equador, são cheios de países desertos, e você tem que ir além do Equador para chegar em outros lugares onde tem uh, países verdes, popul popul uh, populosos, com portos, com, enfim, uh, populações uh, mais eruditas e tal. O escritor mineiro Afonso Arinos do Melo, através de um estudo das cartas de Vespucci, publicado em 1937, até afirma que a ilha de Utopia foi modelada na ilha de Fernando de Noronha. Uma ideia, porém, improvável, pelo menos fascinante. Utopia começa com críticas duras de muitas monarquias e sociedades europeias da época. Mo critica punição desproporcional, morte para pequenos fortes, por exemplo, dizendo isto séculos antes do movimento da reforma penal, ele fala que extrema punição gera extrema miséria. Ele ataca aristocratas preguiçosos. São muito números os nobres que vivem ociosamente como verdadeiros zangões, ele escreve. Ele critica monopolias, fechamento das terras por individuais, pessoas individuais. Incrivelmente, ele tem, também fez advocacia de que nós hoje em dia, em inglês, chamamos quantitative easing, a prática dos governos, a aumentar a circulação de, da espécie de dinheiro em tempos ruins para incentivizar recuperação econômica. Ele foi um keynesiano antes da letra. Durante o Fórum Shakespeare, uh, realizado no CCBB, sab sábado passado, aprendemos que as primeiras traduções de Shakespeare no Brasil, feito por João Caetano, veio através de versões francesas. Eu não sei qual foi a primeira tradução de Utopia no Brasil, mas eu tenho notícias de uma versão de Ana de Melo Franco, uh, curiosamente traduzida, Uh, através da idioma, uh, idioma francês e não do original inglês. De certa forma, eu acho que Thomas More teria gostado disso. Ele foi um pensador inglês extremamente ligado às ideias do continente europeu, que nunca aceitou isolação, isolação e que foi se inspirar tanto dos clássicos gregos quanto das ideias, ideias uh, contemporâneas continentais. Tanto que, ao, penal, ao final, perdeu sua vida quando se recusou a abandonar o catolicismo, como o Dan, seu Danilo já falou. Claro que não é tudo utópico na utopia. Rapidamente, as contradições entram em cena. 
Ele tem uma passagem bem soturna, onde leva o, o leitor para um vale onde acontece a abate de animais. Isto é uma atividade feita por escravos. É proibido qualquer ostentação de ouro, seda, até cores diferentes de roupas. E tem pessoas que dizem que ele modelou muito disso nos monastérios medievais uh, britânicos. Curioso, então, que Utopia está chamado um livro de ouro no frontispício original. Obviamente, tem muito que é um sátiro. Não podemos falar de utopia sem pensar em distopias. No século XX, autores foram interessados em mostrar por que utopias não funcionaram. Animal Farm, 1984, de Orwell, e Brave New World, de Aldous Huxley, são exemplos desse. Hoje em dia não pode falar sem citar o William Shakespeare, que estamos celebrando, como o Paul diz, uh, o, uh, quatro, an, 400 anos da morte uh, do, do bardo. Shakespeare fez uma pequena contribuição para uma peça, Sir Thomas More. E aí... Uh, Vou pedir a vocês, se vocês não uh, dominam o idioma inglês, a uh, uh, usar seus uh, fones de ouvido, porque eu vou citar alguma coisa em inglês. E Shakespeare fica muito indignado com o tratamento de refugiados, num texto forte e bonito nessa peça. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs and their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation. Would you be pleased to find such a nation of barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owed not nor made not you, this is the strangest case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Evidentemente, essa passagem mostra um mundo bem longe de visões do paraíso. Hoje, as ilhas gregas, claro que o, o Mor uh, cita muito coisas uh, da clássica grega, hoje as ilhas que a gente vê, às vezes, são longe da utopia do Thomas More. Eu gostaria de agradecer vocês e espero que vocês tenham dois dias uh, aproveitosos de debates sobre esse assunto. Obrigado. Agradecemos as palavras do senhor Martin. Para a conferência de abertura do seminário Utopia 500 anos, com o título A Utopia como Prática Transformadora da Realidade, convidamos ao palco o senhor Gregory Clays, autor do livro Utopia, a História de uma Ideia, das edições SESC. As perguntas ao palestrante poderão ser feitas por escrito e entregues à equipe do SESC Vila Mariana, que estará nos corredores. So, good morning, and thank you all of you for coming along today. I'm very grateful to SESC in particular for making it possible for me to be here. It's a long ways from my undergraduate examination responsibilities in London, and I must say a pleasant relief from them. So, uh, let me express my gratitude at the outset to SESC for its uh, magnanimity, its hospitality. Uh, it embodies, I think, in many respects, many of the quintessentially most positive utopian qualities in its uh, dedication to bringing culture to the population of this country. So I want to survey this morning the fate of utopia across 500 years. And I want to start by asking whether 
we are here to celebrate or whether we should be here to celebrate this concept of utopia. Or instead, is this perhaps rather a wake, a somber, perhaps funereal acknowledgement of the passing of a brave, perhaps impetuous, but nonetheless, of course, inspirational idea. Great in its own time, but now defunct. As a proposition, Utopia has had a good run, 500 years. But perhaps its shelf life is now exhausted. Perhaps as an ideal of human improvement, its limitations have been reached and its moral and emotional content drained. Perhaps, as the great Victorian architecture critic John Ruskin once said, Thomas More's Jeu d'Esprit was indeed the most really mischievous book ever written. Perhaps then we need another concept to take its place. So we may praise Utopia today, but also bury it, or perhaps herald its half millennial arising from the grave. Whether then we should lament or grimace, shed a salutary tear, or contemptuously slam the coffin lid shut, will depend, of course, on what we see before us. 500 years ago, as we've heard already this morning, in 1516, there appeared in Leuven, modern-day Belgium, the little Latin book we now familiarly refer to as Utopia. As both the no place and the good place, then eventually perhaps also the place one should not go, the dream which becomes a nightmare when we try to realize it, Utopia has become inscribed in our vocabulary and our ideas. It means many things to many people, yet few amongst these would deny the power of the concept. So let's today consider how this came to be by briefly looking first at the book and its times, then at the development of the ideal. I then want to consider Utopia's friends and enemies to unveil one skeleton in the family closet, dystopia, then finally to ask what future, if any, the concept holds for us today. So firstly then, to Sir or Saint Thomas and his ideas. As most of you are doubtless aware, the text is presented to us in the form of a dialogue in which the central narrative about the society called Utopia appears in book two, when the travels of Raphael Hitlerday are related to a rather skeptical Thomas More. So most readers, of course, at this point immediately ask, which is the real More in this division, the optimist or the skeptic? Moore commences Utopia with an account of the desperation of the poor in the England of his day, in book one. We are quickly made aware by the mention of Amerigo Vespucci that recent travelers to the New World had brought back fantastic but compelling tales of their discoveries. Some hinted that conditions were akin to the golden age of Greek mythology, the very opposite, thus, of the contemporary England of Moore's day. Moore would have known of Peter Martyr Danguera's description of the natives of Cuba as having community of goods, and there were other assorted rumors of this type. Few would today describe Utopia's inhabitants as noble savages, but Utopia does appear to be just such a tale. It projects an island lying somewhere in the equatorial regions, founded both by shipwreck and the wise design of the great mariner Utopus many centuries earlier. When we recall that Columbus thought that the earthly paradise lay just beyond the mouth of the Orinoco River, Moore's postulate seems, if anything, less fantastic than this kind of claim. The constitution and mores of Utopia nonetheless appear to owe more to classical antiquity than to the customs of the aboriginal Americans. Yet their peculiarities betray three features which some contemporaries supposed did define native life in the New World and which have become attached 
to our image of utopia ever since. These are, firstly, community of goods. Secondly, an apparent contempt for gold and silver and ostentatious pride generally. And thirdly, of course, the abolition of money, the root of all evil. The discovery of the new world from one viewpoint could indicate that a turning away from apostolic communism, the communism of Christ's immediate disciples, had been a tragic error in the history of Christianity. As we're all also aware, the travel literature which served as a backdrop to Moore's text, and most notably the tradition of Sir John Mandeville's travels of the mid 14th century, was replete with tales of fantastic lands. The names Moore gives, firstly to Utopia itself, then to its capital, Amarat, which meaning obscure or unknown, suggests a satire upon this fantastic voyage tradition. But then, the introduction of Vespucci returns us to a realistic set of presumptions. And yet, Utopia, far from being the perfect society with which it is still much too often confused, is not even the best possible society, given the prevalence of war and slavery in particular. While the ethos of friendship which defines utopia to many modern scholars, this is the central theme of the text, is always commendable. It is by no means obvious that communism is the answer to the woes of England as they are described in book one, where Moore laments that the poor are being hung en masse as great landlords drive them off the land to enclose the commons for highly profitable sheep raising. Communism is the theme which appears to bring the utopians close to apostolic Christianity, or to being more Christian, in other words, than Moore's own contemporaries. But communism is also what Moore, on balance, finds least plausible in Hitler Day's tale. How, he asks near the end, can these utopians really be motivated without the ownership of property? Perennial question. And if this regime of common endeavor works here, he hints as the book closes as to his skepticism as to whether Europeans could ever live this way, converting from their opulence and love of pleasure to this superior platonic and Christian life, a question, of course, many modern students of the book ask themselves. The vision indisputably remains to more a tantalizing and fascinating one, but to many readers, the two islands of Britain and Utopia have much too little in common to imagine that this model is meant to be imitated. Utopia has, of course, several other leading themes which merit at least a brief mention here. Its inhabitants divide their time between 54 almost identical towns and cultivation in the countryside. They dress, eat, work, and behave in remarkably similar ways. They combat vice by a regime of near complete transparency, leaving no space in which crime and vice might flourish. In Utopia, we are told, this is Moore speaking, there are no wine bars, no pubs, no whorehouses. There are no opportunities for wickedness, no hiding places. There is no scope for conspiring in secret. They are always under the observation of their fellow citizens and have no choice but either to work as hard as the next person or else engage in respectable pastimes. We cannot, in Utopia, travel outside our neighborhood without passports. We must all wear the same plain clothes. We must exchange our houses every 10 years. We cannot avoid labor. We all must go to bed at the same time, eight o'clock in the evening, and never under penalty of slavery with someone else's wife or husband. In Moore's time, for much of the population, such restraints would not have seemed overly unreasonable. This is part of the appeal of the text. For modern readers, however, utopia appears to rely upon a relentless transparency, 
severe regulation, and the curtailment of privacy. In both its internal and external relations then, it seems, perhaps paradoxically, perilously dystopian. Utopia then is not really a fun place. It is a safe place. It offers repose, but the price is restraint. Moreover, let's recall, Utopia remains an imperial power. When overpopulated, it sends out colonies, seizing the uncultivated land of indigenous peoples and driving out any who resist them. Well-paid mercenaries keep enemies at bay. The Utopians' much vaunted contempt for gold here standing starkly in contrast with the great value their treasure has when expended on slaying their enemies. Utopia's peace and plenitude now seem to rest upon war, empire, and the ruthless suppression of others, or in other words, their dystopia. And there are other limits to their generosity. The Utopians are tolerant in most matters of religion, but they despise those who deny the immortality of the soul. Nonetheless, perhaps this is all just part of an entertaining story, and it is that. Generations of scholars have reached no fixed opinion as to how seriously Moore meant us to take these themes. There is much jest and satire mixed up in the text. There is little doubt that Moore regarded much of utopian life as ideal, but much more that he thought that most of us could be attained by most of us. Yet Moore's intentions and a close contextual reading of utopia are perhaps secondary to most students today by comparison with the influence of its central ideas. The most common reading of the text, of course, from Vasco de Quiroga, who adapted Utopia as a blueprint to establish a community near Mexico City in the 1530s, to Robert Southey at the beginning of the 19th century, to Karl Kautsky at the end of the 19th century, and beyond. The most common reading has been the realistic one, in which Hitler Day, perhaps more, serves as the prophet of the communist ideal. The reasons for this are not difficult to discern. The success of Utopia coincided with the decline in the belief that the terrestrial paradise actually lay somewhere in this world. It also overlapped with repeated eruptions of the sentiments, often assuming the form of a hysterical egalomania, a passion for equality, which we associate with millenarianism, the prospect of Christ's return, the overthrow of Satan, and the establishment of divine rule. These themes, of course, have a lengthy pedigree. The millenarian wing of the utopian ideal, dated as far back as the 12th century vision of Joachim of Fiore, who divided history into three stages, those of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and for whom the third stage of history, the paradisical stage, where there would be no work, wealth, or poverty, and no food, would find each person evolving into a spiritual being. In 1936, Karl Mannheim, and in 1947, Norman Cohn, were amongst the first to identify the 16th century Anabaptists with the secularization of these millenarian ideas, heralding the great utopian schemes and movements of the 20th century. The 17th century, of course, echoed constantly with utopian schemes, ideas, plans, sentiments, from Francis Bacon to Gerard Winstanley, Harrington, Bellers, Penn, Saint-Pierre, a host of names. In the 18th century, we find that the belief in an original equality of mankind was powerfully reinforced by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in particular. Then in the 19th century, faith in a future heaven also began to wane, and with it millenarianism, which thus, in this reading, necessarily had to be secularized. 
the desire thereafter for a much better state for humanity became thus naturally fixated on the real present and future, on this world. Now, as the great French writer Henri de Saint-Simon famously proclaimed, the golden age of mankind lay not behind us, but before. It lies, says Saint-Simon, in the perfection of the social order. Utopia thus came to embody the principle of equality formerly represented by Christianity. There is a reasonable cause here for seeing what Reinhard Koselleck termed the temporalization of utopia, the metamorphosis of utopia into the philosophy of history, where the imagined, this is Koselleck, perfection of a formerly spatial counterworld, heaven, is temporalized in the 18th century as a key stage of millenarian secularization. Yet there remained, and perhaps I think still remains, much confusion between the millennium and utopia. The leading communist in the French Revolution, Gracchus Babeuf, aimed, I quote, to abolish all frontiers, fences, walls, locks on doors, all disputes, trials, all theft, murder, all crime, all tribunals, prisons, gallows, jealousy, insatiability, pride, deceit, duplicity, finally, all vice. This is, of course, in the words of Richard Landis, a classic millenarian vision of boundless felicity. But utopia is a condition of bounded felicity, of restraint and self-restraint. What the millennial shock wave, as Landis calls it, of the French Revolution shared with utopia was a suddenly exploding egalitarianism described in terms of the mass hysteria of the crowd by the great sociologist Gustave Le Bon. Let me turn now then to consider some of the more notable moments in this process. In the early modern period, the utopian idea as we might conceive it today was often still identified with the provision of security and stability through the creation of institutions which once formed became immutable, unchangeable. Satires aside, those 17th and 18th century literary utopias which reflected Moore's aims seriously tended to regulate luxury through sumptuary laws restricting personal consumption and adornment, and by limiting property ownership in land in particular. Utopian republicanism, as we might call it now, had by 1750 become a distinctive position on the political spectrum, going beyond the notion of an agrarian law to community of goods, what we today call communism. But in practice, authors of fictional utopias toyed with many variants upon these themes, including land nationalization. But the most transparent and rigidly controlled of these schemes have generally today little appeal to modern readers, who expect somehow that utopia and liberty are naturally partners in the first instance and disagree that liberty is a just price to, play, to pay for equality. The French Revolution, of course, represents the first great watershed in the development of the utopian idea in this direction. Here, a republican constitution accompanied an ideology based upon the rights of man, which some have assumed possessed a markedly utopian dimension, the whole concept of rights. The shift towards a much more radical idea of equality, which the Jacobin coup of 1792 produced, also echoed the central theme which we identify with the tradition as such. And beyond this, there were new massive popular festivals, an ethos of increasing social transparency, and much else that reflected the utopian impulse. But here, there loomed too 
the possibility that utopian aims might have dystopian results with the emergence of the Jacobin terror under Robespierre, 1793-4. to The revolution in general also indicated that crucial trend towards seeing utopian aims as realizable imminently in a future to come, rather than as being discovered vestiges of a lost golden age or a state of nature or a tropical paradise or a future heaven to be achieved. Utopia now became Uchronia, the good time which is not yet but upon which we are advancing. The modern concept of progress, an indefinite process of becoming better and more perfect, our own most cherished ideal, though sadly on its deathbed today, emerged at this point. Now we would remake mankind not in the image of original sin, but in that of millenarian felicity. The story of Utopia's advancement from this time is a familiar one to most of us, for we are its adherents and beneficiaries to an impressive degree. The main fork in this road came, of course, with the revolution of 1848, and even more that of 1917, when the communist version of progress came finally to offer itself as the great alternative to the supposed free market variant afforded by liberalism. A general course of increasing perfectibility through opulence, the extension of life, the remaking of the human body, and the relief of pain might clearly fly today, too, as a utopian program. But the enhanced Morian variant of this, achieving all this and adding the elimination of crime, for instance, was clearly inherited by Marxism. This became, of course, the dominant oppositionist ideology of the 20th century. Even before the Bolshevik Revolution, however, the immense controversy surrounding Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward of 1887 indicated that other collectivist variants on the management of modern economies could give Marx some competition in the ideological arena. Marx himself, of course, denied that his own schemes were in any sense utopian and castigated, of course, his socialist predecessors for refusing to harness the proletariat to the revolutionary means required to introduce the new system. But in its expectation of dramatic improvements in human behavior engineered by a collectivist organization of property, Marx, in fact, merits the utopian title, if anything, rather more than those who supposed that such achievements might be workable in a small-scale community. And even Marx remained intrigued in his final years by the prospect that modern communism might indeed have antecedents in the Russian mir, the primitive uh, peasant commune, and other forms of primitive communalism. Nonetheless, it was precisely in such small-scale communities that the 19th century saw utopia unfolding. To spend a day in one, most notably in the Falonstère of Charles Fourier, was in principle to encounter a varied routine of multiple forms of work adjusted to our aptitudes. There would be five or so meals, cultural activities, Sesquiu would play in, great role in this scheme, and a court of love assuring us all a minimum of sexual gratification akin to a living wage. Here there is no languor, no lethargy, no world weariness, only the joie de vivre et de travail. The Owenites, the Cabatis, not to say the Shakers, Etzlerites, Harmonists, and a hundred strands of religious sectarians offer many variants on these themes, though Fourier doubtless promised more fun, perhaps, than all the rest put together. All of these schemes, however, offer security, a Gemeinschaft variant on community, or what I call enhanced sociability, by contrast to the increasingly alienated, insecure urban society which was rapidly emerging in this century. 
In this vision of the idealized village or small town, there is often joy, celebration, creativity, even individuality, not merely security, equality, and a greater sense of community. Trust and familiarity are permitted because the scale remains small. Politics remain personal because no coercive state is necessary. William Morris, amongst others, would imagine that even nations might be remade along the lines of such principles. And yet, with a few notable exceptions, the Amish, the Hutterites, two million Mennonites, many of these communitarian efforts of the 19th century failed, and often, indeed, very quickly. But the exceptions here also prove that communism does work on a small scale. The lack of bloodshed, generally, in so-called utopian socialism validates such experiments to a considerable degree, while hinting that the application of their principles to a large-scale, highly industrialized urban context at a national level may well prove their undoing. Both Bellamy and H.G. Wells nonetheless projected national and world states, respectively, in which both technological innovation, change, and particularly in Wells's case, individuation, were combined with the earlier goals of utopia. Their visions proved immensely influential in the decades from the 1890s to 1914, when the progress of the civilized world in general suddenly came to a crashing halt. From 1917, then, to the end of the 20th century, the battle lines defined by utopia were of world historical significance. Much, maybe most, of the 20th century's idealism was invested in what turned out to be the colossal failure of the Bolshevik Revolution. Enslavement to socialist machines turned out to be no better than servitude to their capitalist counterparts. Soviet apparatchiks were as calloused as capitalist managers and less efficient. Party members were less the perfect specimens of angelic millennial man and woman than a cliquish nouveau riche of privileged bureaucrats. As the great Russian anarchist Mikhail Bakunin had warned, popular control over coercive states had been rapidly lost after the revolution. Already with Marx, though, who is notionally a Democrat, the idea of a legitimate political opposition and a multi-party system become questionable. With Lenin, Marx's promise of a democratic road to communist society was abandoned in favor of dictatorship of the party over the proletariat, and then in Stalin's hands of one individual over the party. It is now indisputable, I think, that Marxism assumed the form of a political and scientific religion with saints, liturgy, sacred texts, and leader worship. Lenin, and even more his followers and Czechist enforcers, quickly took all the property and all the educated to be their enemies and aimed at their physical extermination. The Bolshevik utopia came to prioritize industry over humanity. This became the inner bitter meaning of scientific socialism. Many socialists, George Orwell would later complain, came to see, I quote, the idea of mechanical progress, not merely as a necessary development, but as an end in itself, almost as a kind of religion. The attainment of communist modernity, moreover, quickly came to be seen as entailing legitimately a human cost which it, its proponents were all too willing to concede to meet the scale of their aspirations. To modernize Russia, then China after 1949, was seen by their leaders as worth the life of millions. Possessed by a higher truth, or within sight of achieving the final end of communism, the party, like the 12th century antinomian uh, Waldensian elect, or perfecti, before them, 
claimed the right to act in any way which would hasten the achievement of this ideal. This state of grace and absolution, a self-possessed calm in the eye of the millenarian storm, which permitted any means to this end, was probably the most destructive mentality of all those which Marxism fostered. And so perhaps 80 millions died from 1917 to 1980, striving for a paradise which never arrived. An uncharitable reader might reckon that the slavery in Moore's utopia was in fact only met by its logical corollary in the slave states of Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot. Many others, amongst them critics, like Friedrich von Hayek and Karl Popper, have assumed that it is the search for utopia itself, conceived as a more perfect state of society, which induced such bloodshed. Utopia here, in the eyes of these critics, is a closed society, a repressive society, a society demanding a unanimity which cannot be achieved without violence. It produces a fatuous, ersatz, forced sociability of notional comradeship, which the Polish philosopher Leszek Kolakowski calls compulsory solidarity. Trust, that crucial attribute of utopia, I think the single most important utopian quality here, trust. Trust is eradicated in this system and replaced by universal suspicion. In the account of one of Stalin's most uh, well-known victims, Nadezhda Mandelstam, the wife of the poet. The loss of mutual trust is the first sign of the atomization of society in dictatorships of our type, and that is just what our leaders wanted. So this is the opposite of utopia, indeed. Here, Moore's transparency becomes Orwell's telescreen. Moore's virtues require the gulag. Pol Pot, indeed, su succeeded in abolishing money, but also managed to kill a third of the population of Cambodia. Moore the skeptic, doubting whether community of goods is viable, here trumps Moore the idealist, speaking through Raphael Hitlerday and hinting that it might be. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the case against utopia was bolstered by at least three other modern developments. Firstly, what we often today refer to as dystopia came increasingly to be seen as potentially imminent in the growing role of technology and machinery in our lives. Samuel Butler would hint at this in Erewhon of 1872. William Morris would repeat the message in 1890. The robots of Karl Kapek's famous play, RUR of 1920, would drive the metal point home relentlessly. Then, most evidently, in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World of 1932, the specter emerges of an essentially hedonistic mass utopia but is it a utopia or a dystopia, complete with mandatory promiscuity to inhibit personal attachment. Here, however, behavior manipulation by propaganda would condition humanity to collective identity, a theme brilliantly satirized in Evgeny Zamyatin's We of 1924 and partially reworked in B.F. Skinner's Walden II of 1948. And then, of course, the following year, George Orwell would present to the world the most polished and emotionally penetrating of the anti-totalitarian dystopias, 1984, which remains today the most penetrating critique of the Stalinist mentality of its epoch. Finally then, commencing in the same period, the specter of environmental catastrophe, overpopulation, and resource depletion began to loom upon us. By the late 20th century, it seemed as if humanity might well be facing imminent disaster. In the second decade of the 21st, it seems a near certainty. We have, it seems, survived the catastrophe of totalitarianism only to fall prey to scenarios which appear even more overwhelming. Poor utopia, 
whose hopes are dashed, but even more, poor humanity, who, having gambled so much, may yet lose everything. Such nightmares, nonetheless, clearly indicate the centrality of dystopia to our own times. Dystopian literature may perhaps have fallen short in the face of so much horror in describing the genocides of the 20th century. But now, particularly where science and technology are central, its projections have much to offer. The new, this literature warns us, is not always the better. Progress is not automatic and may be dangerous. What benefits the few may harm the many. Machines may devour us. So may corporations or revolutionaries. Hurtling towards an uncertain but clearly perilous future, we need visions of alternatives, even utopias, to delineate which paths suggest the greater and which the lesser evils. We need, in particular, the long view, not the short-termism which politics and the desire for ever more instant stimulation and gratification force upon us. We face later in this century a near apocalyptic scenario of overpopulation and global warming. Both of these interconnected processes are accelerating so rapidly and so little is being done to retard them, that there is no reason to expect that they can be halted. That's my reading anyway. Here, dystopia races ahead of utopia so far as to leave the latter gasping in insignificance. Well, these reflections leave the friends of utopia, and just to uh, ensure you, uh, to you I'm amongst this group, with some mighty threats to reckon with. Indeed, the three problems of the failure of Moore's original scheme, communism, the threat of mechanization to humanity, and environmental disaster might seem to put paid to all utopian speculation as such. Instead, it might be contended. All the possible futures lying before us are bleak and dystopian. None are pleasant. None are better than the best we have achieved so far which from a utilitarian point of view is the social democratic welfare state. The most powerful promise of all, moreover, that of a millennial remaking of mankind, a reforging of human nature, of the construction of a new humanity out of the crucible of revolution, seems to have failed utterly. Here we see the connections between Jacobin experiments echoing the natural sciences, to create a new egalitarian man and woman, l'homme regénéré in the language of the revolution. Connections here with Victor Frankenstein's creature, with eugenics, with the genetic and artificial remaking of the human body, which increasingly preoccupies us today. The body to one side, however, the moral and mental aspects of this rebaptism of humanity have fallen well short of expectations. Just as, once the Americas were conquered, its inhabitants turned out to be not so much different from the rest of us, so too new Soviet man and woman, forged in the Stalinist furnace, turned out to look remarkably like us too, if somewhat the worse for wear. From this, we have perhaps learned that utopia is not the search for perfectibility, which is a theological quest. Utopia orders fallen humanity, and the zeal of both religion and political religion is one of its greatest enemies. Here we see why the confusion between utopia and the millennium has proven to be of such consequence. There is a good case, then, to be gloomy here. Yet pessimism also has its advantages, which the Blockian school of utopian studies, with its mandatory optimism and insistence on eternal hope, echoing an official adolescent ideology of Leninism, tends to neglect. A realistic assessment of where we're going might indeed well be the only way utopia could ever be achieved. If things look bleak, we ought to say so. 
Historians, in particular, are truth-sayers first and foremost. If hope then results, so much the better. But it cannot precede analysis or replace it. If you just want feel-good assurance, go to Hollywood or go to church. Yet we're all aware, too, that gloom has its limits. In the past several years, we've witnessed populist democratic revivals of various types, which suggest that enthusiasm for substantial political change may once again lurk just beneath the surface of everyday life. To take some European examples, the Syriza party in Greece, Podemos in Spain, the Occupy movement on both sides of the Atlantic and elsewhere, the surprising support in the American uh, political campaigns for Bernie Sanders, democratic socialist principles. Uh, we see here a common thread running throughout all of these movements. All acknowledge that the social democratic consensus achieved in Europe after World War II, with its mixed economy of both the market and public provision of key services, and especially a welfare state which raises the level of the poor and means that the deepest parts of poverty are avoided. This remains for us the most attractive social model. All these movements indicate that the neoliberal assault on the welfare state, in which even the privatization of health provisions, a real concern for us in Britain, is driven by a rabid antipathy to the state as such. All these movements indicate that th this neoliberal assault is reaching its limits. All point also, I think, something which is sometimes not noticed, to a generational gap as large and as resented as that which produced the youth rebellions of the 1960s. Millions are becoming aware that the agenda of austerity cuts only masks massive tax evasion through corporate profit transfers and tax havens. As we now know, the sums involved here are so large as to negate the need for any cuts in social services at all. Just in the case of Britain, such evasion costs about 80 billion pounds per year, easily enough to maintain the existing welfare state. And as the Panama Papers have recently revealed, some 15 to 20 trillion, that's thousand billion pounds, is held in tax havens worldwide. Eight percent of the world's wealth is off the books. A legitimate tax on which would generate, it's now calculated, a revenue of some 120 to 230 billion pounds per annum, and that's excluding a possible wealth tax upon this eight percent. And the willingness of entire economies, notably Greece's, to be held hostage to the IMF and the World Bank, uh, whose ideologies promote privatization, may too finally be reaching an end. Yet we face here a momentous shift in global social wealth, which has concentrated more wealth in the hands of the few, particularly since 2008, than ever before. Their power, blocks all efforts to reform this system. Yet I think we are contemplating before us what I call a glass revolution. A revolution in particular in the sphere of financial transparency, which may revolutionize capitalism more thoroughly than any other movement that has taken place since the Second World War. These not uncontroversial observations indicate that Europe in particular, having fled as a refugee from totalitarianism, reached the shores of utopia in the 1950s and 1960s. The provision of old age pensions, unemployment benefits, paid substantial holidays, shorter working hours, gender workplace equality, a relatively flat pay differential between management and labor, all made up what we might call the mundane utopia of the post-war settlement. These measures created the space for that hedonism which masquerades as the height of humanity's aspirations, to whose deficiencies we are, of course, often all too blind. Looking back 500 years, 
we would not want to say that this is as good as it gets or the best that humanity can do. For we can be kinder, more generous, more sociable. We can redesign cities, neighborhoods, towns to make this possible. We can teach our children, if we can ever stop them from playing computer games, that sociability is preferable to the aggressive selfishness which a brutish conservatism and mammon money worship commends to us. But on this scale, nonetheless, the daily, everyday utopia of the welfare state was nonetheless a mighty achievement. It represents just how successful the idea of utopia as a blueprint, rather than merely a vague dream, can be. The specter of its abandonment and loss and its plunder by ravenous corporations ought to fill us with both dread and anger. When millions echo these sentiments, we will resist the loss of this utopia. And with sufficient effort, we might well recreate it and perhaps more. Beyond this, there will lie future challenges to any supposition of peace, prosperity, and equality. Overpopulation and environmental destruction are likely to wreak havoc on such visions as we approach the close of this century. And yet here, ironically, we might well find that utopia returns full circle and that the only way to end the world's most pressing problems involves exactly that classical Morian regime of regulation which restrains and retrains our natural desires and curtails, at the same time, many of the freedoms which the 19th and 20th century came to cherish. No utopos has yet arisen from amongst us to proclaim this vision. But there is here no reason to disagree with George Orwell, who wrote in 1948 that, I quote, the most encouraging thing about revolutionary activity is that al although it always fails, it always continues. The vision of a world of free and equal human beings living together in a state of brotherhood. In one age, it's called the kingdom of heaven. In another, the classless society. It never materializes, but the belief in it never seems to die out. But this belief needs now, once again, to assume a concrete form, if utopia is to mean something to us today. We must cease to imagine that the wolf will lie down with the lamb, that milk and honey will flow, that the pearly gates of Jerusalem will swing open to reveal streets of gold and walls of jasper. To non-believers, the millennium is dead. Utopia is not. Perfection and the moral rebaptism of humanity are dead. The modest vision of good health and long life, available to all, but with restrained numbers, is not. But to counter nightmares, dreams are insufficient. We need plans, proposals, and blueprints. Utopia's great function is to animate us to provide visions of a long-term future. So in the spirit of Thomas More, let us rethink the century before us and see whether a better fate than that which history seems ready to deliver us can result from the effort. Thank you very much.